how this may play out in the future. Again, this is a graph showing you my lifetime, how much we have used compared to how many planets are available. Uh, and as you use more every year than what nature can regenerate, you accumulate a debt. Now we added up the most conservative United Nations scenarios in terms of population growth, food consumption, agricultural productivity increase, and also quite conservative IEA energy scenarios. And what we came up with is this, that if we truly even follow the moderate scenarios, and all others would be steeper, of course, um, we'd be using about twice the planet's capacity by the time my son is my age. So this is our collective dream that possibly may not pan out. What are the alternatives? And that's where the city starts to play, play in. When you start to look at your investment decisions, you start to recognize that stocks put in place today, be they bridges, power plants, population being born today, essentially they will determine resource consumption 50 years from now, because they will be still around and they will shape the structure of your city. So it's really about the decision point today. Are you building yourselves traps or are you building yourselves opportunities? This is the conversation we had with our friends in Calgary and I think even um, Linda Harvey is here. I, I saw her in the program. Uh, and essentially just thinking helped shift the conversation in Calgary to say, is it really in our interest to expand our city in green space? Are we making ourselves stronger as a city or more vulnerable? Uh, and they started to rethink and I think had a moratorium at least for a year uh, for green space development to say, we need to rethink urban structure. That's the cheapest way possibly to get yourself on the right track by having land use changes done right. We're working very closely with the United Arab Emirates and you would think, why them? They have so much oil. You may not know that they're running out of electricity. Their gas supply is not sufficient anymore by about 2012 and they're now planning nuclear power plants and importing coal for coal power uh, to, to, to maintain their urban infrastructure because the urban infrastructure is so resource intensive that it takes enormous amount of electricity to kill, keep them cool. So they basically build like solar collectors as high rises, you know, no shading, and then they have to cool it down with electricity. And so they have started to recognize that if they don't turn the trend around, United Arab Emirates will not be competitive. It will be a bad investment, all this urban infrastructure uh, in the future. And that's why they have invested massively in this Mazdar project, uh, 30,000 households, I'm sure you're familiar with it, uh, trying to be CO2 neutral. Now, will they be able to get there? I'm not sure, but it's the probably most massive scale attempt to think there needs to be a different kind of future. Same conversation we're having with the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, where the 30 largest, uh, 30 large corporations uh, that are member of the World Business Council are saying, we need to move back to one planet. How can we do that within the next 50 years? Uh, what are the wedges? Um, as we just discussed in the presentation before. London has recognized that challenge, on, uh, particularly also uh, back with uh, Ken Livingston, and, and did a study on how much could we reduce our ecological footprint. And we identified about half the footprint that could be saved. They haven't done it, but just, it's basically a risk assessment. It was done through the business community as well, because London saw it as a risk to be extremely dependent on resources. I don't know if you saw this story just coming out a few days ago saying what happens if your city is not fit for the future. Uh, now in Flint, Michigan, they're considering having to prune their city, uh, being able to operate, not being efficient, not being able to produce high quality of life uh, on, a, on a low resource level and their economy not be able to sustain them. Or are we building cities that build on a one planet principle, that build, that are operating in a way that can be replicated worldwide and thereby being able to be of competitive advantage in a world that is scrambling for resources. Um, I'm not sure you're probably familiar with bioregional. They are now looking at rather large scale communities on each continent that would be able to provide high quality of life within what's about available on per capita basis today. Now let me give you some specific tools how you can find out whether you move in the right direction. One of the graphs on this little leaflet shows you that what we really want is high quality of life, 
One measure is the United Nations Human Development Index that summarizes how long you live, whether you have access to literacy, which is quite important even to operate mobile phones. Um, and the third one is to what extent you have access to income. So the United Nations suggests to be over 0.8 in order to achieve a high level of development. On the other hand, though, we only have about two hectares of ecologically productive space per person available. So when you cross-correlate that, you can say, in order to have great lives, we have to do it in order to make it replicable within this resource constraint. So global average would need to be in this yellow box. We need to learn to think inside the box. Now, how can we apply that to cities? Essentially, most of our development ideas currently still believe that we just move up on the HDI scale with little regard to resources. Resources is a secondary concern. As we prepare ourselves for an ecologically constrained future, we need to reconsider this and say real development, lasting development, is really one that moves us closer towards where we are stable and resilient, as Nigel said. So with this framing, we can start to compare any investment decision. We can say, how much movement do we generate to with the yellow box per dollar or euro or rupee that we invest? And so we can start to rank the sustainable development return on investment for the, for the various opportunities that arise as we try to restructure our cities and prepare them for a resource-constrained future. Another example, before I close, is out of the retail sector, uh, but I think it's quite typical for the urban areas that this Australian retail um, uh, uh, business that probably uh, controls about 50% of the retail space in Australia calculated that for each square meter of retail space, it takes about 1,600 or so square meters of ecological footprint to support this square meter, not for the products being sold, just to produce, to cool it, to heat it, to rebuild it. And obviously, that's a huge cost. So their CEO, rather than firing the environmental team, saw it as a driver to massively increase resource efficiency. And that's what they have done. Now they're the leading edge providers uh, of, of uh, shopping malls that are far more resource efficient. And even though they have had a hard hit during the economic crisis, they haven't given up on the footprint. They see that as a core asset to make sure they produce assets that will do far better, that will outcompete uh, their, their competitors' um, malls. Now, specifics, what does it mean? Here are just a few ideas, but essentially, I think the key lesson for me would be is, yes, big change has to happen fast, that we know already. It is in your self-interest as a city, because nobody will bail you out. You will be stuck with your city. Maybe you can move away from your city, but your city is stuck with your city. So your city has to be ready uh, for, for that future. And in order to make sure things move in the right direction, I would recommend that you have indicators that move very rapidly and see the progress. Once you recognize the challenge, you will start to see. For example, in Zurich, they voted for a 2,000 watt society, which is about three times less energy consumption per capita than they have today by 2050. Then you can calculate how would the housing stock need to look like by 2050 to be there. And then you can start to extrapolate how many houses need to be at the level of potentially zero energy standard per week in order to get there. In Zurich, I think the ratio is about they have now three close to zero energy houses within Zurich, and probably they would have to have to bring it online 25 of them every day. So that's kind of the rate at which they have to change. So by having fast-moving indicators and clear and bold goals, you can see to what extent you're moving in this direction and you're also able to communicate to your constituency why this is the best investment you can make for them. Another example, and with that I would like to close, is that living in a compact city, living in an ecologically efficient city, doesn't have to be misery. Um, we often compare Houston with Siena. Siena uses about three to four times less resources per person. Three to four times less resources per person than Houston, and not because they have better environmental education, just because the city structure invites people to a much more resource-efficient lifestyle. And personally, I think it's quite a nice one too. That's why we have our uh, gatherings often there in Siena, uh, because it's a reminder of 
good lives on not such high resource consumption. Now, Siena 